Good evening. Good evening. My name is Christopher Decatur. I'm a junior here at Virginia Theological Seminary, and I serve as the outreach coordinator for the Center of the Ministry of Teaching here. Tonight, I have the privilege to introduce you to a very special person in my life and a priest in the Episcopal Church. Personally, I've had the privilege to call Tracy my priest, my boss and colleague, a mentor, and most importantly, a friend. I give God thanks daily for bringing Tracy into my life and for being a teacher who has helped form me into the person, the seminarian I am today. Just in the course of today, Tracy and I have shared laughter, deep conversations, and theological reflection. I look forward to her being able to share the same with each of you this evening. Now here's the professional welcome for Tracy. <laughs> just to make sure that I haven't missed anything. The very Reverend Tracy Lind is a newly retired Episcopal priest, a city planner whose ministry has included work for social and environmental justice, interfaith relations, sustainable urban development, arts and culture, and progressive theology. She is also the author of Interrupted by God, Glimpses from the Edge. For 17 years, Tracy served as Dean of Trinity Cathedral in Cleveland, Ohio. From 1989 to 2000, Tracy, Tracy was rector of St. Paul's Episcopal Church in Patterson, New Jersey. Tracy has received many, 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 many awards and recognitions, many, <laughs> many, and has been a prophetic voice from a variety of pulpits. Tracy and her spouse, Emily, live and continue to live in Cleveland in their sustainable home overlooking Lake Erie in the heart of Cleveland. We are so grateful that Tracy has traveled from one snowy environment in Cleveland to a quite chilly Alexandria to share with us her story and a message that has developed over the course of the past year. Please join me on behalf of Virginia Theological Seminary and the entire Center for the Ministry of Teaching team by welcoming my friend, my role model, and pioneer in our church, the very Reverend Tracy Lund. I'm going to just go home now. Wow. This is one of my favorite songs. So I am uh, grateful to Dean Markham and to Dr. Lisa Kimball and the Center for the Ministry of Teaching for the invitation to be here at VTS this week. And I'm grateful to Chris for organizing this visit. And I must say, I am blown away by the simplicity and the elegance and the grace of the new chapel here. And those of you who are students here are so fortunate to be able to worship daily in this extraordinary sacred space. So enjoy it while you can. <laughs> on to the matter at hand. <coughs> Excuse me. On election day in 2016, while the world was focusing on the election of a president, I was diagnosed with dementia. And it was an unwanted interruption. And at first, I tried to ignore it and to make light of the increasingly obvious signs and symptoms. And when others began to notice that something was off, I tried to deny it, thinking that it was normal aging. And having just lost my mother to Alzheimer's, I thought that perhaps I was one of the worried well. But one day in the spring of 2016, shortly before my 62nd birthday, while washing my hands in a public restroom, I looked in the mirror and I did not recognize my own face. I thought, you know, who's that attractive woman in the room? <laughs> and then I looked around and realized there was nobody else here. That disconcerting episode um, galvanized me into making an appointment with one of Cleveland's leading neurologists. And after six months of tests and exams, I heard the words, you have dementia, early stage, 
probably frontal temporal degeneration, otherwise known as FTD. The doctor explained the diagnosis. He answered our initial questions. He gave us a brochure and advised us to get our financial and legal affairs in order and suggested that, yes, it might be time for me to step down from my job. As you can imagine, we were stunned. We wandered out of the doctor's office into what I'm coming to call the wilderness of dementia, disability, and discernment. We had to accept the reality of my condition. I had to retire from cathedral ministry, and we had to discern what was going to become of us. Like many people who receive such a diagnosis, we, we found ourselves in a season of relief and grief and escape. For months, we sequenced through the Kubler-Ross stages of denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance, like a washing machine cycle over and over and over again. I was sort of relieved to have a diagnosis and to understand that it wasn't just in my head, but it was really in my head. <laughs> that there, there was a reason for the cognitive challenges that I was having. And frankly, I was relieved to have the burden of work off my shoulders and to not be hiding my disease. Shortly after we retired, I, we went to Paris, traveling by way of a transatlantic cruise. And for nearly 4,000 nautical miles, I tried to come to terms with it all. And as we passed through the Strait of Gibraltar, crossing between two continents, Europe on one side and Africa on the other, under the full moon of Holy Week, something inside of me shifted. I literally felt it. And I found myself ready to face this new chapter of my life wherever it was going to lead me. And when on Easter morning in the American Cathedral of Paris, Pierre Wallen, the Bishop of the European Convocation, proclaimed that Christ had risen and we rise. I found myself with tears in my eyes rising. At dinner that afternoon, he asked me what I wanted to do with my life in ministry. And at first I thought, my life in ministry, my ministry's over. And then he pushed it a little bit. And I said, well, I wanted to continue to preach and teach. And I wanted to travel and play music and write and make photographs. And I also wanted to explore the spirituality of dementia, to be an advocate for people living with dementia and to help destigmatize this dreaded disease by speaking about it from the inside out. And in that moment, as I heard those words coming out of my mouth, I realized that I wanted to reframe this interruption in my life <coughs> and to transform it from a, a death sentence to a pilgrimage from an intrusion to an invitation. I wanted to live what I had been preaching for over 30 years, that out of pain comes joy, out of brokenness comes wholeness, and out of death comes new life. Bishop Pierre and my dear friend Lucinda Laird, the Dean of the American Cathedral, some alarm is going off on my arm, <laughs> the Dean of the American Cathedral in uh, Paris suggested that I should begin this project, this new chapter of ministry, with a fall tour of the European Convocation. So for the past year, I've been traveling around the globe, preaching and teaching about dementia from the inside out. And in doing so, I'm getting to know and I'm learning to love the person I saw in that restroom mirror the face that I didn't recognize. <clears throat> I was a pastor who could see you twice a year and remember to ask about your job search and to inquire about your mother's health. But now I might not recognize your face and I probably will not recall your name. I was an executive 
He was no longer able to plan and organize and execute projects. I am a writer and a public speaker who now often can't find words. Very grateful for Google and spell check because the word when I'm looking for it often pops up and I can find ways to ask for help with the word from my computer. And I seem to have a daily quota for conversation. Those of you who had dinner with me last night saw it begin to happen. As the evening would progress, it gets harder and harder to talk. I'm a photographer who is no longer able to manage my camera settings, so I only use an iPhone now. I'm a guitarist who can't remember the chords and sometimes the words to really familiar songs. I'm a sailor who's forgotten my knots and a golfer who, no matter how hard I focus, cannot remember where the ball landed. I'm a cyclist who regularly loses my balance and a hiker who now walks with a somewhat tentative stride. I'm a reader who struggles to remember what I just read, a seasoned traveler who now gets anxious in airports and hotels, a city dweller who now can get nervous on buses and subways and busy sidewalks. I'm a foodie who has a hard time ordering from a menu, and I'm an extrovert probably the biggest extrovert you will ever meet, who used to be able to walk in and command any room, and now I get overwhelmed at parties. Early onset dementia is robbing me of many of the strengths that I valued all these years. I've watched many people hide dementia, so have you as if it's something to be ashamed of or embarrassed about, as if it's a weakness or a punishment or may, maybe even a sin. If only she had eaten less red meat and more dark green leafy vegetables. If only he had done the New York Times crossword puzzle every morning. If only I had practiced my yoga or my meditation on a more regular basis for the past 10 years. And the list goes on and on. I liken dementia to cancer in the 1960s or AIDS in the 1980s, an incurable disease spoken of in hushed voices. I don't want to live with dementia on those terms. I believe that denial isn't useful, that honesty is important, that an early diagnosis can result in a higher quality of life and that transparency makes life easier for everybody involved. An early diagnosis allowed me to exit work gracefully, to put our legal and financial affairs in order, and to make plans for the future, trying to imagine how I might experience the fullness of my life as my dementia progresses. It's also given me the opportunity to do what I love and to spend time with those whom I love. Honesty has afforded me the time and the space, the incentive and the willpower to be intentional about self-care, exploring ways to manage and perhaps slow the progress of my disease. As a pastor and a theologian, being transparent has encouraged me to make sense of dementia, to consider its spirituality, to give it meaning and purpose, and to share my learnings with others. Dementia is a growing and expensive global health issue. Dementia per se is not a disease, it's rather a, a broad ca category of symptoms that result from some kind of brain damage or brain shrinkage. And there are lots of different kinds of dementia, just like there are many varieties of cancer. And because the specific type of dementia can only be determined for certain through an autopsy, post-mortem that is. <laughs> People with dementia will tell you that at the time of diagnosis, we all hear the word probably. You have dementia. It's probably Alzheimer's disease or vascular or Lewy body or FTD or some other variety. FTD 
is a rather rare form of dementia, but it is the most common form of dementia for those of us under the age of 65. It's a progressive shrinkage of the temporal and frontal lobes of the brain that result in a persistent decline in language, mobility, behavior, executive function, that is the ability to organize and, and make decisions, and short-term memory. FTD is very complicated, and there are many varieties within FTD itself. And the life expectancy of one with FTD is somewhere between 2 and 20 years after diagnosis with an average of 7 to 10. I've always been an outlier. So I'm hoping that this time being an outlier might be on my side and put me on the long side of 20, but we'll see. Although dementia mainly affects older people, and this is a real statistic, it's 1 in 4 over the age of 60, 85, and 1 in 10 over the age of 65, it's not a normal part of aging. I have a father-in-law who's going on 92, and he is sharp as a tack. And uh, dementia can happen to anybody, even those in their 20s, very rare. According to the World Health Organization, some 50 million people on the globe have dementia, and it's expected to increase to over 130 million by the year 2050. Every three seconds, someone in the world develops dementia, resulting in about 10 million new diagnoses a year. And at present, dementia is the seventh leading cause of death in the world, and it's the leading reason for disability and dependence and sometimes financial hardship among the elderly. Dementia doesn't seem to care about race, creed, income, or education. It truly doesn't discriminate, but access to quality care does. You know that dementia is estimated to be a $1 trillion global disease. It's about 1% of the worldwide gross domestic product. Frankly, I worry that as baby boomers start to age, and dementia begins to grow at a rapid pace. This disease could bankrupt Medicare and Medicaid, and I fear that we'll start warehousing those who can't take care of themselves. Like many others, living with dementia every day is a struggle. While I might not show it, in the words of Christine Bryden, who is the author of an extremely helpful book that I commend to you entitled Dancing with Dementia, I feel like a swine gliding above the water and paddling frantically beneath, struggling with aspects of life that I used to take for granted, like peripheral awareness, reaction time, balance, reading, writing, speaking, energy level, multitasking, and decision-making. I get anxious and I get tentative. I'm afraid that I will forget something important or not recognize someone I know or that I will become overwhelmed by my environment. And I've learned that anxiety is an undercurrent of this disease and that people with dementia often live on the edge of panic. My spouse Emily and I are continually developing strategies to cope with these new challenges. I've limited my number of activities and, and conversations during the day. I've organized my closet so that I only see a limited number of items and they all go together. I've just learned that this is pretty fashionable. It's called a, a capsule wardrobe. <laughs> when going out to a restaurant, we try to look at the menu in advance so I can decide slowly what I will eat. And I avoid, to the best of my ability, really crowded and chaotic places and in places where there's a lot of stimulation like oh, sports bars. Over the past year, I've been asking myself a number of questions like, where is the grace of God in all of this? What are the unexpected gifts? What's the teaching and wisdom from a life with dementia? And that's what I want to share with you for a bit of what I'm calling the lessons of dementia for me. First one I call no longer the captain. There's an ancient proverb that Jesus uses in his, one of his final conversations with Simon Peter. 
It's about the young being able to dress themselves and go where they choose while the old require support and need someone to lead them, perhaps taking them to places where they do not wish to go. I'm learning this lesson firsthand and too soon. Because one of the realities of dementia is that your world gets smaller and, and more confined. While I'm still able to manage most aspects of daily living, I'm no longer able to lead a complex and large organization. I'm still able to drive, but in due time, I will have to give up that source of independence. I'm able to travel. This is my first trip on my own. Emily's at home. She's taking a break, and she's a little nervous about me not getting lost and confused, and you should see the details of my itinerary. And while I want to stay home for as long as possible, there might come a time when I'm going to need a level of care or I will be isolated, and that will require me to move into assisted living. As hard as it is to no longer be the captain of my own life, there's also this newfound freedom of not being in charge. Actually, it's something that a lot of retired executives experience whether or not they have dementia. And there's also this wonderful gift in being able to celebrate and, when asked, being able to coach others as they lead. Speaking of places we don't want to go, if you haven't already done so, it is never too early to get your advanced directives in writing and then to discuss them in detail with your doctor, your spouse, your children, and your clergy. And it's really important to be very specific so that others can honor your wishes when you are no longer able to communicate them. End of life decision making and end of life care for people living with dementia is really complicated and I'm, I'm not gonna get into that today, but I have lived that journey firsthand with my mom. My second lesson is called The Way of the Child. Do you remember the 1980s movie regarding Henry starring Harrison Ford? It's a, about a New York lawyer who gets shot in the head, bringing his career to a screeching halt and leaving him with both brain damage, but also the spirit of a child. And he begins to engage his young daughter and their puppy dog, I think, in a very new way. That's how I feel most days. I'm in this aging adult body with a brain that is damaged, but a spirit that is becoming younger. So I'm starting to see life through the eyes of a child. I ride my bike with new enthusiasm, sometimes pretending like it's a horse. I explore tidal basins and I look at art with the curiosity of a kid. I laugh at silly bathroom jokes. I cry at the drop of, the do of a dime. I like funny sitcoms and I watch them because I get to be a part of community without having to remember everybody's name and talk. I now understand why people with dementia sometimes are sitting on the edge of the world kind of watching it go by because it's actually sort of comforting. I sometimes want my teddy bear. I actually travel with a little stuffed toy. And there are moments, and I know it and I don't like it, but I can feel when it happens, when I reach for Emily's hand, not as a lover or a spouse, but more like a child reaching for the hand of a parent. Jesus once said, truly I tell you, unless you become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Sure, there are challenges. But honestly, at this stage of my disease, I'm experiencing the divine in some new and wonderful ways. And I'm beginning to wonder if dementia has provided me with a shortcut to the realm of God. Great wisdom teachers, including Jesus, speak of dying to oneself and being reborn, or losing life and finding it anew. Richard Rohr calls this process falling upward into the second half of life, discovering what Edith Wharton 
described as the fullness of life. The first half of life, you know, is about building a container called identity and filling it with family and friends and education and career and hobbies and stuff, lots of stuff. We also fill our first half of life containers with our successes and our failures, our accomplishments and our defeats. The second half of life happens when for a variety of reasons, maybe it's the loss of a job, the loss of a spouse, a midlife crisis, a serious illness, the contents of our identity containers are spilled out and refined and the container, now worn and dirty and chipped and perhaps even broken and re-glued, is refilled. And now, with all of its contradiction and paradox, with its pain and its joy, we hold our containers in what Rohr calls luminous gravitas, or a bright sadness. <coughs> I realize that I am falling upward into the fullness of life with dementia. I have no doubt that I am losing the life I've always known. I've had to let go of a lot of stuff. But I'm also certain that I'm finding a new life. When I deny the reality of my disease, when I grieve the lost aspects of my old identity, and when I resist the emerging aspects of the new me, I get all tied up in knots. But when I accept what has died, when I let go of what has been lost, and when I celebrate what is being reborn, when I try to love and care for the person that is emerging, I start discovering surprising gifts and strengths and a different kind of balance and a new way of living in the world. I'm, I'm turning my dementia into a pilgrimage, what Gil Safford, an Episcopal priest, called a wandering with purpose, an adventure in learning and spiritual growth and what I like to call my own elder hostel. But many days, I and, and Emily alike, we feel like strangers in a strange land. And so as we walk this new path together, we're following the advice of the Sufi mystic and poet Rumi, who wrote, be the soul of the place you are standing. In other words, embrace fully the situation in which you find yourself and seek the good that it has to offer. I think that's one of the basic teachings of our Lord, and I'm finally getting it a little bit. Bobby McFerrin, 1988, wrote a number one hit entitled, Don't Worry, Be Happy. <laughs> and then that song is full of some really important insights about the detrimental impact that worrying has on our well-being. McFerrin sings, in every life we have some trouble, when you worry, you make it double. That's probably why Jesus said, do not worry about tomorrow, because tomorrow will be in worries of its own. Well, I'm discovering that since I can't return to the past, it's, it's done, it's over. And since I can't predict and control the future, and frankly, I don't want to think about the next stages of this very much. I have to live in the here and the now. And when I live in the present, when I don't regret the past, when I don't worry about what lies ahead, I'm pretty happy. In some ways, maybe I'm happier than I've ever been before. Maybe my definition of happiness is changing. Or maybe the freedom from worry is, in fact, the source of happiness. As a pastor, I've taught that the cult cultivation of mindful awareness is essential for human well-being. As a person living with FTD, I'm now learning that an intentional daily practice of mindfulness actually helps to manage the constant anxiety that accompanies the early stages of this disease. My own practice, for better or for worse, and not as regular as it should be, includes meditation, and yoga, swimming, prayer, reading, writing, music, gardening, photography, walking, and expressing gratitude, especially expressing gratitude on those days when I'm not feeling very grateful.
Emily and I are learning how to live with dementia as what we call our daily dancing partner. Doctor's appointments have become a part of our regular schedule, and I'm not allowed to go to the doctor by myself anymore for fear that I won't remember what the doctor says to me or that I won't tell the doctor what I need to say. So we have to go together. So we've made doctor dates. After we go to see the doctor, we go out to lunch or shopping or a movie or for a walk in the park. And it's our way of turning these lemons, and there are lots of lemons into this, into lemonade. And it's also a really great way for us to keep our romance alive as we become care partners in this chapter of our marriage. The pastoral theologian, Scottish pastoral theologian, John Swinton, talks about living in the present as becoming friends with time. I love that phrase, becoming friends with time. He writes, to love one another, we need to be present for one another. And to be present, we need to learn to use time differently and more faithfully. He suggests that this means that we have to redefine productivity and and busyness. I just lost my place, so give me a minute. Um, this redefining productivity and busyness, learning to use time differently and more faithfully, I think is a really important spiritual and practical lesson for caregivers, care partners, and for clergy. It's not always how efficiently meals get served, medicines get administered, rooms get cleaned, individuals get dressed, or pastoral calls get made. It's about the quality of time spent with those living with dementia. It's about patience. It's about taking the time to be present, to listen, to touch, and to sit quietly with one who thinks and talks and eats far more slowly. I wish when I was a younger priest, I had learned that. The number of times that I simply made a pastoral visit and it was check it off on the to-do list. When people would ask me about visiting my mom in the memory unit, I would say, well, she probably won't remember you, but she'll be glad you came. And like my mom, I don't always remember what I've done or where I've been or the names of people I've met. But in the moment, I love going there and doing it and meeting them. And I love being with people who will take the time to move more slowly with me now. Too many people with dementia, you know, just give up and think I can't do anything. Unfortunately, this attitude is reinforced by a world that approaches dementia from a deficit perspective, noting all that has been lost. And there's a lot of loss, but there's also more. I've read about writers who become potters and physicists who become pianists and CEOs who become gardeners. And as I've witnessed in so many people living with dementia, and I now see in my own life, there are amazing opportunities to be had in this journey if we are willing and allowed to claim them. So when you're dealing with someone who has dementia, it's important to take a realistic but positive approach to encourage their gifts and strengths, to acknowledge their challenges, and maybe help them explore new gifts and activities along the way. At the AFTD conference last week in Chicago, I heard this, this wonderful line that I'm carrying around with me. This guy said, I can no longer drive a car, but I can ride a bike. And when I can't ride a two-wheel bike, I'm going to ride a trike. And when I can't pedal my trike, I'm going to get electric assist. Well, you know what? I'm not really comfortable driving all that much. And I do ride a bike, and it does have electric assist. And when I can't ride that and keep my balance, I'm going to get a three-wheel electric assist bike, and I'm just going to ride it around and let people smile and say, oh, isn't she cute? <laughs> you know, Paul... St. Paul once said, there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit, and varieties of service, but the same Lord, and varieties of activities, but it's the same God who activates all of them and everyone. 
One of the important lessons that I'm learning, and I, I wrote about it last week in my weekly blog, is the truth will set you free. Denial is a fairly common reaction to upsetting news. Do we believe the child who whispers the pain of abuse, or the teenager who reports bullying, or the employee who brings charges of harassment, or the immigrant who pleads for refugee status? We often miss the truth because we can't or we refuse to believe the message or the messenger. And people sometimes say to me, people often say to me, actually, you don't seem like you have dementia. And I bet some of you are thinking that right now. But what does that mean? Ah, yes, somebody with dementia is wandering around a memory unit with cookie crumbs on her shirt, which is oversized and stained, and wearing adult diapers and baggy stretch pants, and holding a stuffed animal, and staring into space, and maybe babbling or moaning, right? That's not me. Nor is it a lot of the other folks that I've met over this past year who are in the early to mid stages of this disease. Some days I feel like my old self and I question the diagnosis, but then something will happen like getting disoriented at a crowded party, frightened in an airport, startled on a busy sidewalk, struggling to find words and make sentences, having an outburst in public, being overwhelmed by the number of clothing options in my limited closet, not being able to order anything off the menu or meeting somebody several times in 24 hours and for the life of me not being able to hold on to their name. These moments remind me that yes, I do have dementia. Some of my friends on the FTD Facebook support group call it having an FTD day. One of my new friends with early onset Alzheimer's says there are days when he gets bit in the butt by dementia. I've learned that denial is a common challenge, especially for those of us with early onset. That means under the age of 65. Because it's such a devastating diagnosis, friends and strangers really want to offer comfort by saying things like, oh, we all forget where we placed our keys, or we all get confused, or sometimes I can't recall my best friend's name or the day of the week. These days, I'm getting fairly direct about letting the well-intended know that it's neither comforting nor helpful to tell someone that their reality seems to be an idle tale. That's straight out of the Bible. Gospel of Luke, resurrection story. It's what happened to the women when they went to the empty tomb. The disciples thought it was an idle tale. In fact, it is one of the most difficult parts of coping with this illness and it can lead to a really unhealthy cycle of denial, shame, and blame. Many individuals with dementia are not sitting in chairs lost in space. Instead, we're out living our lives to the best of our ability as we try to destigmatize this dreaded and misunderstood condition, believing that if we are honest about our reality, the truth will set us free to explore the fullness of life with it. As dementia runs its course, individuals often do end up in wheelchairs and eventually in bed. And at the end stage, especially with FTD, are unable to speak and swallow, thus becoming very reliant on the kindness of others, even strangers. And for me, this is a really frightening prospect, being totally dependent on others, unable to communicate, confined in my movement, and isolated in my disease. A lot of people, according to John Swinton, worry about being forgotten by God and other people when they can no longer remember who they are. I'm not worried about being forgotten by God. I am confident that God will be with me to the end and beyond. For in God, I know that I live and move and have my being, and therefore I really believe deep, deep, deep inside of myself that nothing can separate me from the love of God. However, I do worry about being forgotten by other people. In fact, my biggest fear is that this big old extrovert will be abandoned as this disease progresses. 
So I'm lining up, I used to say a small circle of friends, but it's actually kind of a large circle of friends who have promised to visit me when I can no longer go out or even talk. That they will come and they will sit with me. They'll watch TV with me. They'll read to me. They'll make music with me. They'll hold my hand. They'll remind me of who I was in the world and how much I meant to the world. And maybe they'll have to remind me of who I am. I'm also making a list of the music, the films, the poetry, the food, and the television shows that I enjoy so that when I'm not able to communicate, my care partners and givers will know my personal taste and not impose their own. One of the hardest things for me was every time I walked into the memory unit to see my mom, they had Fox News on. My mom and her friends didn't watch Fox News. It was CNN or NPR. And I would say, why do you have Fox News on? And they would say, they don't care. Well, I take an issue with that. I think people do care, even if they can't say it out loud. Welcome, inclusion, hospitality, and kindness are really important to people living with disabilities of all sorts, especially cognitive challenges. And individuals living with dementia and their spouses and their children sometimes often become strangers in their own communities. As I'm starting to learn firsthand, we have difficulty participating in communal life, especially large events with lots of people and noise and activity. And for you seminarians and clergy who are here or who are listening to this, this, this live feed, it can be coffee hour. It can be worship. It can be the parish potluck. We get overwhelmed by all the stimulation, and sometimes we act inappropriately, and we often go to the sidelines, and we sit quietly, and eventually we drop out of sight. We cross to the other side of life as we once knew it. And sometimes it's really hard for our loved ones to get us ready to go out in public and then to manage, to manage us when we're out in public, and so they get exhausted, and they drop to the sidelines. And then, as the old saying goes, out of sight, out of mind. And moreover, as my mother sadly learned, some old friends are afraid to visit because it's painful, scary, or inconvenient, and some people even think it's contagious, though it's not. One of the things that we always did at Trinity Cathedral and in every church I've ever served, and I encourage you who are clergy or lay staff to think about doing is a quarterly review of your parish roles and to say, who have we not seen in the last couple of months? And then go find out where they are. One of the messages I want to leave with you today is the importance of being with us to the end of life's journey. When people can no longer attend community gatherings, the community can come to us, though in small doses. When people with dementia can no longer remember who we are, and not all of us with dementia will forget who we are. Some will. Others do become, as John Swinton suggests, our memory. Not only reminding us of who you are, but if necessary, reminding us of who we are. When people with dementia can no longer care for ourselves, spouses and partners become lovers in new ways. When spouses and partners get exhausted, friends can offer respite. The church can offer respite. When people with dementia find ourselves in assisted living, caregivers must resist the temptation to infantilize us, to treat us as infants and children, but rather see and treat and respect us as mature adults. That's at the heart of what it means to be community. The faith community has an important role to play as the health crisis of dementia grows. Churches need to be visible communities of acceptance and belonging and compassion, where those of us living with dementia and our families, especially our spouses, can find a home of sincere welcome and embrace and a place where we get to express the fullness of it all its pain and its sorrow and its joys and its possibility. As clergy, those of you who are clergy, you will need to develop an intentional practice of really seeing and knowing and understanding and appreciating and including people with dementia 
and their spouses and in some instances their children. And that is a commitment that requires us to come really close to that which so many of us fear. And finally, the faith community is needed to advocate on behalf of those living with dementia, encouraging society to provide a quality of compassionate care that understands and recognizes and respects that there is still an adult person living in the midst of confusion and memory loss. One of the challenges for people living with dementia is that they lose the ability to tell their own stories and to advocate on their own behalf. And that's why for as long as I am able, I am determined to preach and teach and tell my story of dementia from the inside out. And I'm sure as this disease progresses, the story will change. So thank you for listening and I'm delighted to take questions from this room or from those who are perhaps on the live feed. Uh, the community, some seminarians and staff here at VTS have given me a couple questions to um, give to you. Um, a major fear people have around aging and dementia is being a burden. Um, how do you recommend talking about this with people? About being a burden? I think you have to talk honestly about it. First place, what does it mean to be a burden? Um, for me, caring for my mother who was living with dementia, uh, I was the designated daughter, was a mitzvah, not a burden. It, it was a blessing to me. It was the greatest honor I had in my life, was to walk that journey with her. And, um, and I think that, I think the, the issue of the burden usually falls on those of us who think we're going to be the burden, not those of us who want to to be a part of the journey. And I think uh, one of the things that I say to, to my um, senior colleagues and friends is it's really important to let your children, especially in on this journey and to give them permission to be a part of it uh, and to recognize that they wanna give back all that they received. Um, one of the really funny stories in my life was uh, when my mom was still in, independent living um, and um, my mother who was one of the most put together people in the whole wide world she was a she was an executive nurse um, and she had advanced dementia and she wasn't showering showers are very frightening for people at the end of the, the later stages of dementia because well just think about it you get in the, you don't understand all of a sudden there's this water coming on you right and so she wasn't doing that, and and um, I recognized that this was an issue, so I tried to get her in the shower, and she wouldn't get in the shower. And so finally, I, did, I didn't know what else to do, but I took her clothes off, I took my clothes off, and in the shower we went together, and it was kind of the most remarkable experience of my life. I've never really spoken of this publicly, actually, but there I was with my mom, her body, my body, right up against each other. And I realized, my God, this is what she did for me when I was a child, an infant. I came out of her and that intimacy came back and all we could do was laugh. We laughed and laughed and laughed. I got her clean <laughs> and, and, it was one of the most holy moments of my entire life. So I think this burden thing, I think the burden is on us who don't want to be the burden. And I think that's sometimes a matter of pride, maybe. So um, for our children and youth ministers out there, how do you think children in a church can help care for others with dementia? Oh, goodness, that's easy. As I talked about being a child in spirits, one of the things that people with, with especially more advancing dementia, is they grow to love children. It's fun to be with kids. Um, and I think if, if kids will just be kids around people with dementia, they will find a playmate in this grown up adult with, with some brain changes. So I think um, 
for people who are in assisted living, they can go visit, they can, they can send cards, they can send photographs. When kids can come up um, in church and, and give hugs and, and cause they're not so turned off by the scary part of it. So what are some of the most effective or uh, ministries to reach out to those with dementia and their caregivers? Well, one of um, so there are a couple things. Visitation is really important. Just going and visiting and being there and realizing that you might just have to sit quietly for a while. Um, offering to provide respite care for um, somebody who just wants to be able to go out and have their hair done or go to the grocery store, or go out to dinner. Offering to provide to organize respite care and take somebody out to dinner is a really great thing. Um, so those are things that the church can do. I think another piece of the ministry is, is we can really look at worship and say, is it dementia friendly? How confusing is it to worship in my church? How many hymnals do I have to hold at one time? If somebody's lost in the prayer book, can I kind of just kind of help them a little bit. Take a look at coffee hour and make sure that there are, and this is one of the things we didn't do so well at my cathedral. We had our coffee hour in the piazza and there weren't tables. So a lot of it was standing. And you know, the reality is people with dementia don't stand very well for very long and they maybe need a place to, to put down the, the cup and to sit. And they also maybe need to have a place where they can sit and one or two other people can come up and sit with them and talk with them rather than this whole milieu. Um, and, and, and I think um, another piece of it is even organizing programs. There are things like dementia cafes where, you know, you really invite people with dementia and their care partners to come together, hosting support groups, those are all sorts of things. And there's an advocacy role. I mean, I don't want to get into it all now, but there's some very complicated Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security issues involved, especially for people with early onset dementia when it hits during your earning years. Yes. I um, spoke to uh, the fact that when you forget what you're going to say, what you can say, I, I know this now. We're at dinner and that happens. What is uh, a better pastoral response when that happens? To you, one of the things you can do is to help the person remember where they left off. Okay. Uh, the first thing you have to do is be patient. Sure. I have what's called primary progressive aphasia. And, and that is losing language. And one of the things I've learned, maybe it's not quite a spiritual lesson Emily says yet, but I'm working on it. I've always been working on the whole thing of the Trinity, right? The doctrine of the Trinity. I served at Trinity Cathedral, so for 20 years nearly, every Trinity Sunday I had to figure out how to say something meaningful about the Trinity. Well, now I've decided that there's the Trinity of language, which is we have to... In language, we have to decide what we want to say, remember how to say it, and then mechanically get it out. We learn this as infants. When you have primary progressive aphasia, you start to forget that. Your brain doesn't remember how to do it. And so sometimes what happens in a conversation you, you can see it now. It's much better when I have my notes. But in a conversation, it takes me a while to say, what is it I want to say, to find the words to say it and to get it out. And sometimes, by the time I'm ready to get it out, one of two things happens. The conversation's moved on. Or I feel like it's E.F. Hutton, you know, everybody's kind of waiting for me to <laughs> speak. Or I'm so exhausted that I just say, oh, it's not worth it. So one of the things is first is patience. And then secondly, you can gently help somebody. If they can't find the word you might want to say, oh, you know, is it the gas station? Whatever the word is. The other thing with primary progressive aphasia is we often say the wrong words. And when I'm home with Emily, I'll say the wrong word. And we just laugh about it. And she's gotten to the point that she can understand it. I'll say, will you pass me the elephant? when I might mean toast. Um, 
So that, that, that's one thing. The other thing is, is that people with dementia, we don't, multitasking is something we really don't do. We just do everything really fast. When I was younger, I used to be able, and I prided myself about this, every Thursday I would go in from New Jersey to New York for spiritual direction. And I would go in the Garden State Parkway, usually eating something, talking on the phone, maybe smoking a cigarette back in those days, um, making a note of somebody I remembered that I had to make that pastoral visit to, thinking about the spiritual direction, throwing money in the toll booth and driving 65 miles an hour at rush hour. Well, I, can't, I can't do that anymore. And what I've learned is there is no such thing as multitasking. We just do everything really fast. So when you're with people who have dementia, you've got to remember they really move slower. They can only do often one thing at a time, and sometimes you forget how to do it. So a lot of times I'm saying out loud all the steps of everything I have to do, and you got to bear with me. That's a, a, a long answer. Sorry. Yeah. Just a tiny, very specific question. Sure. Do you recommend when someone is struggling to find work, should I try to supply the work, or should I just sit back and give them the time to come up with the work themselves. I, I think it's a, a both and. Um, give me time, but if you really see I'm struggling, and you, you do it gently, but, but do give me time. Do give me the time to speak. And then, and one of the things is if you're in an ongoing relationship with someone who's struggling with aphasia, you can ask them, how would you like how would you like me to help you about this? Can I be of help? That's helpful. What is useful here in that that relationship? And I'll tell you I'll tell you the truth. I don't know if other people will, but I will. That's helpful. Yes. Is there ever a problem with anger or rage? <laughs> um well. I do get enraged sometimes, um, and I don't. One of the things that I've lost is a lot of my filters, which means I can't filter what's coming at me, and sometimes I don't filter what's going out of me, and and um, and I I have to watch that. Um, I don't mean to do it, and I get embarrassed by it, but. But under those stressful circumstances in a train station or an airport or traffic or a sidewalk or a restaurant, I can say something inappropriate. And I really try to catch that. I am not angry. I think Emily at times might be angry. I'm not angry. Anger is not going to help me. I, re I really, truly... Christopher can probably, I, I'm not angry about this. I do not blame God about this. In fact, I'm very grateful because God has helped me figure out what to do with it. God didn't give this to me. So I'm not angry. But I do sometimes flare up. I don't like that side of me. That's an FTD day. Yeah. Um, suggestions for ways to support people who are suffering from dementia as they serve in the church. We have long-standing members who are experiencing some dementia. How do we support them so that they can continue serving as long as they're able? Well, again, you know, what I think we have to do is bring dementia out of the closet. I, I God, this seems to be have been my whole ministry. In 1980, you know, I was bringing the issue of sexuality out of the closet, and now I'm bringing the issue of dementia out of the closet. Thank you, God, um, for that ministry. <laughs> I think a we got to be able to talk about it, and we got we got to be able to to talk both ways about it. People with dementia and their loved ones need to begin to acknowledge it, and those who are in community with people with dementia need to be able to talk about it, and to be able to say, you know, maybe serving the chalice is no longer your ministry, but maybe you could help. Serve the bread, but that. <laughs> so, 
great part about being retired. Um, sorry, Odina the Chapel. You know, maybe there's another ministry. Maybe I can partner you with somebody in the ministry so, um, um, so that you can, you can do ministry. Um, again, I think it's about having those honest conversations. And, 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 and the truth of the matter is you might offer relief to somebody who is not able to bring it up. As long as you don't do it publicly and you do it in a very, I mean, I would make an appointment to go sit with them and say, you know, I've been noticing that, you know, you, you, you're having some challenges now, you know, um, administering can, as a chalice bearer. Can we talk about that? And just do it with love and respect and don't infantilize them. And help them, make sure you offer them another ministry. Yes. I'm in the health field, and so I know all sorts of great resources in this area. So if I can help anyone, please great. let me know. And if you haven't heard um, Alive Inside, I don't know if you've seen the video, but you could Google it and see it. Um, I think it just goes back to not just talking about disease, but talking about the individual um, and remembering we are who we are our whole journey. Uh, and God loves us where we are. And um, Alive Inside shows a man who doesn't talk to anybody, not only not even his own family anymore, until they play music. It's yeah. from his era of time. And you said you're making a list of things that are you, that you might not be able to say anymore, but having that list for your, your people around you to remember to play, this man all of a sudden um, comes alive and he says, you know, I am, I am alive with the Holy Spirit and I am giving love. And all of a sudden... Is it called musicandmemory.org? It's a program. Yeah, and the video just, is just, uh, just Google Henry. What? Hen Henry and, and, and... Henry, right. That's the video. Mm -hmm. But there's a whole conversation we could have about music and memory that we can't have. I just, You're going to have to call it when we've got stuff. I just want to say thank you for your life of courage and faithful living and modeling all this for us. It's, 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 thank you. Thank you. It said a website simply called Tracy, T-R-A-C-E-Y, Lind.com. And I'm trying to write weekly so you can follow that. I am preaching throughout our wider church, and I want to do that as much as I possibly can. So um, you can invite me to do that through the, the website. And, you know, we're trying to, to organize this in some sensible way sensible way and i just believe that as as our church ages the episcopal church that is and as a trustee of the church pension fund i'm, I'm really aware of of our demographics um, we need to come to terms with this as a church we need to claim this as a ministry we need to be recruiting our millennials but we also need to be caring for our seniors. So thank you so much. And again, thanks to VTS and the Center for Ministry and uh, one of my favorite sons, Christopher. Thank you very much. And thanks for coming today. Thank you.